delighted to welcome Adria Lopez Bocells, who completed his PhD at the University of, of Lisbon in 2018. During his doctorate, he studied the effects of um, Amazonian rainforest fragmentation on tropical bats using autonomous ultrasound detectors. He lately uh, has been focusing on the soundscape exploration in order to promote sustainable land use. Um, nonetheless, his main area of interest has always been bat ecology and conservation worldwide. Uh, particularly with the most severely threatened species and habitats. He started working with bats at the Natural Science Museum of Granollers in Catalonia in 2005. And after five years of bat research in Europe, in 2010, he concluded his BSc with a final project uh, on bats in Colombia, which was his first contact with neotropical species. Afterwards, he jumped to Sydney in Australia to carry out his master thesis studying competitive behavior between flying foxes. And more recently, he has also <laughs> joined quite a few bat related expeditions in North Africa, Kenya. Yeah, it's Um, sorry, uh, in Madagascar, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, um, totally dependent on subsistence uh, rice agriculture, with big problems of harvest loss uh, and heavily threatened endemic bat populations due to the vast deforestation uh, happening. Uh, because bats are known to be excellent pest controllers, Adria will work um, to assess the effectiveness of bats um, as pest suppressors in rural areas uh, using bat boxes uh, and field experiments while promoting uh, bat conservation um, among local uh, villagers and farmers. Uh, and this is part of his work as a National Geographic Explorer. Um, I believe that is what Adria will be talking to us uh, about today. So welcome, Adria. Uh, thank you very much for coming. and. Um, very much looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you very much, Elisa. Thank you for your nice words and this very nice presentation. Um, so thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to be here today in the 35th webinar for, you know, but from Bats Without Borders. And today I want to talk about Bats as Pest Suppressors, but more than that, I think that what I want to talk about is like a little story about how these kind of projects have been evolved from the very beginning when I started working on that in 2005. So let me start sharing my screen. Uh, if you can confirm, let, let me just give me a second. Uh -huh. Okay, can you just confirm? Yes, that's, that's showing up your presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's go. As I was saying today, I want I would like to explain or present here a little story about how these projects on ecosystem services have been evolving since two thousand five in several countries. So it's it's going to be kind of story more than a research project presentation. Um. For those who doesn't know me, I started working in this little museum of natural science in Spain uh, in 2005. So my first steps on the bad wall just start here in this building. And one of the first projects that I was involved was just uh, about ecosystem services. And that was a topic that was so exciting to me that I could not leave it you know, for the, during the last decade. Um, I, one of the reasons why this topic is so important to me is because we we're facing serious problems about bad perceptions among the society in i would say almost all the countries in the world so there is no borders here no difference I, there are differences but of course the, the project is so common and the perceptions that people have from bats just undermine conservation's efforts so strongly in in many countries that Ecosystem services, at least to me, is a way to overcome these problems. And it's something that we can use to improve bat conservation. 
And that's the reason that since I started working on this, I, I basically, I've been working and trying to keep pushing this topic ahead in my, in my career. So, and this is something that it's not really new, actually. Um, there was Pliny the Elder, like the first century before Christ, that he already mentioned that is his, in his you know, master book, Historia Naturalis. He already mentioned that we must thank bats because they feed on mosquitoes. And the fact that he mentioned that we should thank them, it's basically a recognition that the, these animals are actually doing something that is good for us. And of course, I know ecosystem services is something that has been very heavily debated in scientific circles and naturalistic circles, because it's kind of controversial if we have to value an a taxa or a species for what they do to us, or if we should not do that. But at least in my opinion, it's basically a tool that we can, we can use to start working on conservation. Even if we need to increase the content and the biological content that we explain to the society. So let's go back. So we will go back to this question at the very end of the presentation. Um, what turns back bats so in so important for uh, ecosystem services? In many countries, during, for example, the summer in Europe, bats are are like. Um, are breeding, so they have the pups and the females are lactating. That means that they are avid consumers of insects. And because they have so broad and uh, opportunistic diets and they hunt more or less everything that is in the right size, in the right space, uh, this thing just turns about an excellent candidate for providing you know, pest control in this, in this sense. So there's many calculations of this. There's people that they say that they consume 50% of their weight in insects. Other people use the, you know, the well-known value of two to 3,000 mosquitoes per night. Even if we don't focus on the exact number, the thing is that they consume a lot. And because they consume a lot, they are excellent you know, elements in the ecosystems that can be used in our favor when we have these uh, large uh, agricultural areas where these pests are just basically minimizing the harvest a lot. And, okay, it's not passing. Okay, so that's not, also not uh, very new. It's not something that is very pioneering. In 1958, there was this Great Sparrow campaign. I don't know if you've heard about it, but if not, I'm just dropping here a couple of links because this story is amazing. In China, there was this emperor who was uh, basically encouraged a lot of people to kill sparrows because uh, they mentioned that sparrows were consuming the grain. And it was a very difficult times in China. There was quite a lot of hunger, a lot of difficulties for the society to survive. And, and that was one of the solutions that they suggested, just killing sparrows to avoid you know, the loss of grain. But the problem is that these sparrows were actually consuming a lot of pests as well. And when they get rid of all the sparrows, like millions of sparrows were dead, the problems for the country were even harder. And this was a, a very serious uh, problem at that age. They had to actually import sparrows from other countries to compensate it. It's something that it's been on the news, let's put it that way, for many, many years. And again, it's not something that I just came up with this idea. Uh, also in China, for example, uh, people were using, uh, farmers were using the, these kind of ants, these species of ants that were predators of the cotton cushion scale, this, uh, this pest um, for the cotton. In Mauritius Islands, the same story also happened. There was these uh, birds consuming the locusts and you, in the USA and also in Europe and in many other continents, they also use some insects that, con that they, are, uh, they are tremendous predators to, um, to different pests. Okay, in this, uh, in this case, again, the cotton cushion scale. So the, the use of ecosystem services to compensate the losses in agricultural lands, that's something that's it's not new. It's not new, but it's relatively new when we speak about bats, okay? 
um, previous cases in which these have been used quite efficiently. Probably most of you know how the tequila have been related to bats because without bats, there's no tequila. And these have been like uh, promoting a lot of projects, initiatives, conservation, changes in, in management plans, etc. from in Mexico, in the US, uh, in many places. So this is an example of how ecosystem services can be used to change perceptions and change laws. Just to convince people, again, as I was saying, like it's something that it will not be the solution for the world, but it can be used in our favor. When society is so alienated from natural world that we need to find key elements to reconnect people with the bats and conservation. And many, many other examples exist. There's also an extremely interesting uh, paper from Mexico led by Constance and Veronica and some colleagues in which they demonstrated how cash crop increased in size and flavor thanks to the bats. Same with durian in Southeast Asia, same with uh, in Sulawesi. So there are so many, so many examples of the ecosystem services that bats provide to human societies. Of course, I could not, uh, I would not just do this talk without mentioning the, you know, the job by Boyles and colleagues in the U.S. in the corn, where they basically studied the effects on of bad saving some some production of corn. If you check this 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 plot that you can see here in the bottom right side of my slide, you can see the exclosures and the controls. And let me let me mention what what is exclosure and control. This is a method in which we as scientists, we can reproduce a world with no bats. And that's something that it's extremely difficult to take into, you know, to carry out in the field, because basically what we need is to isolate part of the agricultural lands so the bats cannot go in. And we are reproducing, we're creating a world where no bats are hunting the insects. And then we can basically calculate which is the actual, the real effect of bats on the, on the production, okay? As you can see here, the blue line uh, represents the damage kernels in the exclosure. And then the gray line is the damage kernels outside the exclosure. And the differences are very, very clear. So um, as soon as they get ripe in the, in the field, they got like more than twice or even three times more damage uh, kernels inside the exclosures. That is a, like a historical, is a, a, is a, yeah, is a really important paper and study that basically started the, the story of these exclosure experiments in the field. And this, as you have seen and probably noticed in the previous slides, I was mentioning ecosystem services, uh, mostly related to pollination, probably mostly uh, relate to seed dispersal, but none from, you know, from the agricultural perspective. So this is one of the first one. And after that, there are even more papers. In Chile, for example, some, some colleagues replicate the same study than Boyles did with corn, but they did in, in grape. And the, the results were very, very similar. So the damage was just twice as, uh, as much inside exclosure than outside. Again, so the damage in a world with no bats was extremely higher. Uh, and they also, just, just for you to know, they calculate the damage both in the grapes and also in the leaves of the, of the grape trees. Something that boils didn't, didn't do, obviously, because they were different species. And again, uh, we move uh, to Thailand in the other, in another completely different continent. And there was this study by Sarah and colleagues where they calculate the, the number of rice mills that were saved by bats. The difference here is that they actually calculate the thing in a region here in the south of Thailand where there, there are these huge caves with massive colonies. And these massive colonies has a great impact on the rice production. So this is completely different, different study. They did not uh, prepare the exclosures, but they calculate the ecosystem services these bats were providing on the people from Thailand. 
And if you check the number here, it's quite outstanding. That there's like 26,000 people per year in which bats are just basically protecting their rice mills. Uh, okay, so as you've seen in the title of my talk is bats as pest suppressors in rice paddies. And I'm especially interested on rice because for me, you know, working with wine, with tequila, it's fine. It's a really great topic to connect with people. But rice is like the one of the main food staples for humanity. It's a cereal that is basically providing food to so many, many, many people. And we have the evidence, as I've mentioned just before, that bats are helping to save um, but rice production. And rice also usually have these quite extensive lands covered by, by rice plants. Like rice paddies are not small. They used to be quite big. Even in, in countries like uh, India, in Madagascar, Thailand, in these places. So basically in this image, you can see the millions of tons produced uh, by rice of the world. And in this one is basically, again, the, the kilos uh, of, of rice that are produced. Okay, so you can see that it's something, it's a massive topic. It's nothing localized, it's nothing like, um, you know, it's a topic that is important for food security. And it's something that, because we're changing agricultural lands so intensively all around the world, we need to basically assess how can we improve the land management. Okay, so after this very brief introduction uh, about the ecosystem services, meaning provided by bats and quite a few examples that we have been all around the world. I would like to go you know, straight away to, to the story I wanted to tell you that it's basically the story of the projects that I've been involved. As I mentioned in the beginning, I started in 2005 in the Natural Science Museum of Grenadiers. And yeah, I should not forget that of course, everything that I will be presenting today is a result of a massive uh, effort by a large group of people, not only myself, of course, there's so many people just behind. And I try to put all their faces in the presentation, but I'm sure I've, I've missed some. Okay, so let's go. Uh, in 2005, I started and the first project I was involved is something that it was already ongoing when I started, okay? And just to start from the beginning, there was uh, this uh, Ebro Delta. The Ebro Delta is one of the biggest deltas in Europe. And there was this project in which they installed hundreds of bad boxes in the region, hundreds of them. We did not that, do that. So it was someone else that basically won these European life projects to restore natural habitats. They installed the bad boxes and they basically forget about them. Okay, and then after a while, uh, it happened, well, Carlos and Chevy both here are the main, they were the main leaders of the project, okay? For those who doesn't know the area, this is how it looks like. This is um, an amazing area with natural areas like these wetlands, uh, coastals, coast, uh, coastal wetlands in, in Spain. But the, the truth is that I would say 80, 90% of the area is covered by rice paddies all over, okay? They look like, like this on the bottom. But it's, it's crazy. So almost everything in this natural park, it's covered by, by rice. And the rice in this area just uh, suffers from many different sources of problems, uh, saying like wind, storms, like uh, fungi, very, very, very strong fungi, like called spedicularia, rodents, different insects, larvae, moths, etc. Especially this one. This one is the rice borer moth, Kilosupersalis. This is one, one of the most, uh, one of the worst species of um, moth for the rice paddies all over the world. It's widespread and it's creating lots of problems. And it's called vor borer because basically when the larvae emerge, it basically perforates, like damage all the stem of the plant and it killed the plant straight away. Anyway, so I was saying that um, there were like hundreds of bad boxes installed in the region, and these bad boxes were forgotten for, for, for months, for years. And then the farmers realized that uh, 
since this moment, they started having less and less um, moths in the in the in, in the rice paddies, and they were losing less and less rice over the years. So they basically contact us and they ask, "Hey, do you think that maybe?" this decrease on the pest might be related to the bad boxes. Do you think there is any relation? And they contact us because we were the only ones working with bats. And we went there, we went there to check and we started the project. So we found that the bat boxes were crowded of bats. Like they, we had like 3000 individuals in very few hectares. Like they were completely overloaded by bats. 95% of the bat boxes were quickly occupied and we continued the project. We basically collected um, uh, data along the years for many, many years. And that's what we found. If you check here the black line, this is the, infest the infestation, the best effect uh, in the rice paddies. And it was decreasing systematically from 1999 to 2008. And at the same time, the bad boxes just were occupied in five years and they kept the, the levels very high for the long time. Nevertheless, that was not enough for us. So this suggested as like a relation between bats and the pest, but we wanted to be absolutely sure that the decrease on the pest were just because of bats. We collected feces, uh, we got like between 20 and 50% of positive samples. So we conclude with enough evidence that the bats were actually hunting um, these insects. And then we complemented this with an acoustic study and we tried to see if bats were most active where the pest was the, you know, the most abundant. And this is like a very simplified results of the study that you can check on the, you know, on the paper if you're interested. But basically when there was no rice borer on the landscape, we found no differences uh, on the, in the mean bat passes of these bats. But the thing is that when we found the rice borer, the bats were there more intensively. So basically, basically they were following these booms of uh, Chilop supersalis in the rice paddies. And the Chilop supersalis is an insect that has three generations. That happens with many other species. But we found out that the most important generation, or we, we hypothesized that the most important generation was the first one, and when the first small generation was cut down by bats very efficiently, then the other two uh, population size of Chilo supersalis were not that bad. And at that moment, that was critical because the treatments for the rice paddies were done by helicopters, were planes, and the, you know, the pollution of the you know, underground waters, the soil was massive, like, you know, the killings of frogs, snails, just that was amazing. Um, so far, the thing is that there are equivalent workers as bats and they are using pheromones to contract Chilo supersalis. But the, the story was so nice that we actually calculate like very easy numbers for the farmers to understand and doing few calculations that I will not go through now, we calculated that in order to prevent the aerial treatment, we uh, so the farmers needed a bat box with around 10 bats in one hectare, okay, 100 meters by 100 meters. And if they wanted like to control really all the pest levels, they needed about 50 animals in one hectare in a box. Of course, that's a calculation. That's something that it's mathematically and theoretically suggested. But it's something that emerged from, from the numbers that we that we used. Okay, and one of the thing, the cool things of these projects is that uh, we ended up doing some educational material for people, for farmers, to understand these scientific papers. And I'm I'm very glad with the results of this. I wanted to show you this short video of two, it's two minutes only. So I, I hope that you can enjoy it and I will continue the story afterwards. But just for you to know, this is something that basically uh, resulted from the effort of uh, almost seven, eight years of work in the Ebro Delta. Uh, I hope you can see the sound. Yeah. It's two minutes. Bats and agriculture, what do they have in common? In the year 2000, the Ebro Delta Natural Park placed 70 bat boxes around rice paddies. In 2001, 200 bats were found in the boxes. And in 2006, 
3,500. Meanwhile, the population of rice borer moths, an important pest, began to fall, and much of the spraying of the paddies with pesticides, by then carried out using light aircrafts, became unnecessary. Farmers thought there could be a connection between the rise of bats and the fall of moths, so we began to study it. After a few years, we published the results, quantifying the service bats provide to the producers. With densities of around 40 bats per hectare, there is no need to use pesticides to control the rice borer moth. And this is not an isolated example. In 2014, an insightful research was published. In Thailand alone, by preventing the loss of crops, bats guarantee yearly food supply for 26,000 people. In 2011, the prestigious journal Science highlighted the economic importance of bats. If bats disappeared from the United States, it would cost 23 billion a year in pest control. Preserving biodiversity in agricultural areas is a sustainable solution to the serious environmental threats we face globally. We are beginning to understand how bats benefit us, and we still have a lot to learn. At EcoBats, we conduct applied research that can be exported to other regions. This way, we promote the use of natural biodiversity as a pest control method. By joining our project, you will help us understand the role played by bats in controlling pests in your crops. Join the project! Okay, so that's the basically the same story, but probably explained much nicer than I did before. Um, one of the side results of the of this project is that again in these bad boxes we found out like uh, Pipistrellus natusi, which is a migra migratory species in Europe that is very hard to capture, and it's just to you know to show you how these projects on ecosystem services sometimes they also provide nice surprises you know for ecological knowledge and natural history knowledge. And again, one of the outputs of this project is that is that basically we convinced the natural park to build the hotel that we mentioned to the you know that we we call it. It's like a a huge bad box, like probably four by four meters, with capacity for thousands of animals. And this um, this large building was basically installed in the middle of the rice paddies in the Ebro Delta, and people there they love it. So the conclusion here is that in this like 10 years long project, more or less. What I've seen is that when we arrive, the farmers just, they did not take care of the bats. They, they did not see them, you know. And now when we arrive with our car and our logo type, just, you know, with the bat, they all love it. They want bat boxes, they like the bats and they are just so proud of the bat populations all around the Delta, at the Ebro Delta. And that's something that basically opened my eyes because in just 10 years, I saw a complete change of perceptions in this farmer community. And that was very, you know, uh, stimulating. Uh, after all these years, we developed another project regarding bad boxes that it was very, um, also, it was innovative in the sense that, you know, that we have so many bad boxes in the market, but to be honest, we have, a lot of the same. If we look for bad boxes for birds, we have specific boxes for part of species. We have specific boxes for 30 species, specific boxes for swallows. But for bats, we just have flat, cube, and rounded bat boxes. And yes, we have three colors, but more or less they are all the same. We don't know exactly why some species they use one bad box or another. So there is a still a long way to work. And as we've seen before, bad boxes might be a really, really nice solution to change perceptions, to increase you know, biological integrated pest management. So they are promising tools for bad conservation and for conservation, biodiversity conservation in global, but we still do not have enough knowledge to know how they work and how we should design them, okay? So if you check this, this figure from one of the, of the papers, you will see that on the right side, there's these white boxes that look slightly different than the normal bad boxes you might be used. Garazzi, uh, Garazzi was the student that basically carried out all these projects in uh, 2015, more or less, okay? 
And basically, we tested the suitability of all these bad boxes, and we developed something with this. This is called chaff. This is the residuals from the rice. So, you know, when you cultivate rice, this is the part that you basically throw away. And we found a way to recycle them. So we created a new material with, with the chaff, with some part of fibers, like completely natural. And we built bad boxes with specifically this material that was kind of a white cement, okay? We tested the temperatures of the, of the bad boxes because we knew the temperature of the bad boxes was kind of a limiting factor for, for bad occupation. And basically because they are usually too hot in countries like, like ours in Spain. And we found out that these white bad boxes were extremely good for places like rice paddies, okay? And what I'm really, you know, happy with this is because this project was like the closing part of the of the pest control project that we did in the past because we kind of closed the cycle. We used the residuals from the farmers to build new bat boxes that they could use to attract the bats, control the the insects like the chilo, and they got more rice to do more bat boxes and just keep going and so on and so forth. So it's just a cycle that we closed in a very nice way and to close the story. That was in 2015. And then we continued the projects on rice again. At that time, Chevy was leading another project <clears throat> in the Northern part of the, of the Iberian Peninsula. And we basically uh, redirected our efforts and we worked on the, on the rice paddies, but instead of focusing on the rice plants, we wanted to check the mosquitoes and other deleterious insects like chironomics. Okay, what we we basically collected the feces again using the very the very similar methodology than in the past. We use ultrasound detectors, and we found that bats were just affected a lot with temperature, but they were also affected by mosquitoes, and that they were consuming quite a lot of chironomics. For those who doesn't know, chironomics is like a kind of larvae worm that they just they are found on the mud. And they move like in, you know, like swimming in the mud. And what they do is basically either consume the, the seeds of the rice or releasing the seeds. So when they plant the rice on the, you know, on the crops, if they are moving on the mud, the thing is that they release the, the, the grains and they just, they float on the surface of the water and they, they are killed. So you lost, you can basically uh, plant a lot of rice uh, of rice in, a, in an area and lose 50, 60, 70% very, very easily, okay? This is how it looks like, okay? This is the head of the chironomics. This is the, the head of the larvae. And this is like the ram, the damaged rice, okay? And very similarly, another project that we did again now in the Ebro Delta was led by Cecilia a few years later. And the thing is that by analyzing the diet genetically from the feces, Cecilia found um, this uh, Lizardtropus orsophilus, which is an insect with a very nice story. So it was a pest for rice in the States. Then from the States, it invaded China as an invasive species. And then from China, it's been going west quite slowly. China, India, Greece, Italy, and now finally we found it in, in Spain, okay? So just thanks to the effort that we did by analyzing the diet of the buds in Ebro Delta, we were able to spot these species in up to four different points as a, like an early emergence signal. So we are now very, we also obviously, we send information to the authorities and we recommend them like, just keep an eye on this insect because it was, as I said, it just traveled from the US to China, to India, to Greece, to Italy, and now Spain. And maybe in the future, it will be something that we will need to work on and try to find ways to, you know, to avoid um, rice uh, losses. So the story just keeps going. Uh, we were in 2020 already with this last paper, but I wanted to mention that during this last period, there was a chance to start working in Madagascar. This chance was uh, basically emerged from a collaboration with Marca Vesa. Marca Vesa 
is a professor in the Helsinki University. And she was working in Madagascar for many years, I think for 12, 13 years at that time. And she was highly interested in our projects on rice paddies. The reason is quite obvious because Madagascar is one of the first rice growers uh, countries in the world. And also because Madagascar has suffered uh, a heavy deforestation, uh, deforestation pressure since the last 50 years. So as you can see in the image, like in the 50s, there was already uh, just few forests remaining in the east coast of the country, but now it's something that is ridiculous. It's just about 10% of the forests remaining on food. So it's very, it's hard. When you go to Madagascar, it's hard. You will see some image at the end. So basically I accepted the offer, obviously, from Marca Vesa to join her in the field and try to explore the opportunities to, you know, to export our experience from Spain and do something similar in Madagascar and trying to use bats in Madagascar to protect both the forest and the rice paddies. One of the first things that we did was exploring the areas in Ranomafana National Park, several villages. We found, of course, um, many bat species. Madagascar have about 50 species. 80% uh, of which are endemic. And we found, well, we, we of course sampled them using misnets, traditional methods. And we found out that basically in the traditional villages like this, there was no big colonies suitable for, you know, strong pest control. But in buildings like this, we found, you know, enormous colonies of thousands of molossids mainly that could be uh, very useful in, for our purposes. Uh, all of this information was published to make it publicly available. But basically what we were interested was to see if these animals were actually hunting and doing the same thing that they were doing in Spain. Okay, in Madagascar, four of the main habitat that you can find is this, like irrigated rice on the bottom, hillside rice on the slopes, forest fragments and secondary vegetation. We use acoustics again to understand how the bats were moving and where the bats were hunting. And we found out like very, very clear results that the bats were hunting on the rice paddies, both in the irrigated, but also in the, in the hills. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Also, again, we collected the feces. We tried to understand if they were consuming the pests or not. And we found that, yes, two species uh, that were uh, damaging rice production were found in the feces. For example, the first one in 1969, they reduced by 20% the total rice production in Malaysia, which is a lot. And the other one that was also suitable for, for rice. And of course, just to mention that we found other economically important rice pests um, like sugarcane, macadamia, and of course, insect disease vectors. But that's that's an or, another story. So we are now focusing on the rice. We tried to uh, carry out many group uh, grouple sessions with farmers to explain uh, and to discuss the problems that they have, that they had with the rice, the rice production. And at this point, the project ended. Okay, at this point it ended, but we try to continue in the future, you will see. Uh, more recently, we got off, obviously the problem with the COVID. We got a National Geographic grant to continue the project in Madagascar, but unfortunately the borders were closed for two years. So we had to move our project from Madagascar back to Spain. And the story continues here. Karma is now a PhD student in our group. Uh, basically, one of the main uh, objectives of, his, of her thesis is to quantify and economically assess the ecosystem services of the rice borer that was supposed to be in Madagascar, but because we could not fly there, we did everything here in the eastern part of, of Spain. As if you remember well, uh, boils had these exclosures in the corn. We did it, uh, we replicated the story in the rice paddies. Okay, that's this exclosure looks looks quite small, but it's actually 20 meters by 20 and five of height. That's a lot to be, you know, to be built um, by normal people like us. 
we created four blocks and then we replicated the same study design. So one exclosure and one control area, just to compare what would happen in rice paddies in a world where no bats were present. And we had the advantage that here we had a kind of a you know, large colony roosting on the, on the farm building. Um, this is a short video of how, how the um, exclosure is uh, being built. As you can see, we were like five people approximately setting up some, some poles, pushing the misnet, like the net, and then, okay, the walls, and that's it. <laughs> two minutes, it's done. So that was actually one or two whole days uh, sweating under the sun, and that was kind of story. Okay, and this is how it looks once the, the exclosure are, are built in the field. You can see here, they already look pretty big. And basically we created these kind of cages to test, to test experiments. One is here, the other one, if you can see, I don't know if you see my mouse, but it's just around the corner. That's two of the exclosures. Then we had two in another, in another area. Okay, luckily we built them when the water was not in the field because, you know, setting up these exclosures with water, that would be, extremely you know difficult and that's the same thing once the rice was grown so the sorry the um, <clears throat> the disclosures were set up for four months four and a half during the whole uh, rice cycle and we basically we make sure that the insects could fly in and out freely with no problems that's something that i forget to, man to mention before so this is us you can see here Okay, and then is, well, that's Karma, happy with the result of her project. Uh, what she did basically was calculate the number of dead uh, rice plants during the whole period and see how it, uh, you know, how the production and the damage change over the time. And then doing some mathematical calculations, we try to estimate the value of these animals and, uh, you know, the kilos and they avoided yes, uh, yield loss, okay? So basically to make that very short, uh, here you can see the number of kilos saved by hectare. You can see that it ranged a lot, but it can be up to 150 kilos per hectare in the maximum, okay? And you can see here the blue line is the exclosure and the treatment is the red line. We had a lot more accumulated of infested stems in the exclosure. So summarizing, when no bats are flying on the fields, we have much more infested stems. That's pretty easy to understand. But if we want to make it understandable for farmers, we need to translate that into money, which is basically the universal language. And we did that you know, for the hectare. Again, we used the prices on the market in 2022 or 21. And then we calculated that the maximum amount of money that you can save is about 100 euros per hectare. Of course, if you have like less damage, the, the price is reduced. But the amount of money that they can save, that's pretty, pretty uh, impressive. If we, if, you, if we extrapolate that to the cultivation surface in Spain, that goes up to millions. But of course, this is like, okay, big maths. Um, Again, like Karma just continued her project. And what, he, what she did was to use a experimental experiment to test an hypothesis. That is basically that bats were actually affecting the reproductive activity of the insects without even consuming them, okay? We, uh, they basically collected the, the, the insects, Chile supercellus in the field using ultraviolet lights they placed in, in, in 10 boxes in under captivity conditions, and they used uh, bad lures to play back um, the normal bad sound during a night, and then having another, you know, another boxes uh, as controls with no bats flying. Basically, the idea is that having five boxes with no sounds, like isolated with no bats, and five boxes with the ultrasound of bats. And the results of this project was, was basically amazing. Uh, Karma counted the number of eggs and the number of layings in the plants. So basically she left the insects to lay the eggs 
And she found out that, uh, sorry, here it is. She found out that in the control, so when there was uh, no, no sounds, there was so many more eggs than in the, sorry, again, in the control with, um, with no bats, with so many more eggs per laying. And when there was ultrasounds, then the, the animals, the insects, just they get afraid and they put less eggs in the, in the plants. So basically the conclusion is that bats were not only providing ecosystem services by hunting the insects, which is the traditional knowledge and the traditional theory, but they also um, have, uh, they are providing ecosystem services by avoiding the laying oh. of eggs mm -hmm. in the, you know, yeah, by, by the females. Uh, here you can see Carol. Carol is another friend and collaborator, and she is replicating the exact same project in uh, about exposure in Mexico. And the idea is to replicate everything in, in all the world, like in Mexico, in Spain, in uh, Madagascar. And finally, what we did, uh, we got a grant from WWF to do a documentary, a photographic documentary of all these projects. And we try to bring this experience to the, you know, one of the first of the first countries. Like Joan and myself went to the to Madagascar, and we tried to document all these studies and all these relations and all these findings using photography as the main aim. Let me check the time. Okay, I have eight minutes. I will go very quickly on this. Uh, if you imagine Madagascar in your mind, you probably think about tropical forests, okay, something like that. But the truth is that Madagascar is like 90% covered by rice paddies and agricultural lands like this. It's pretty much destroyed. And the thing is that uh, they use the, they use all the old forests to cultivate rice. So they basically use the slash and burn to to you know to use fire to put down the forest and cultivate more rice. They are suffering a lot by, <clears throat> by uh, insect pests. They can lose like between 40 to 80% of the harvest because of this. And the only solution that they have is to use, as I said, slush and burn to, to create more areas to cultivate. They don't even export rice. They, they basically cultivate for self-survival. Self and anything. And a part of the direct deaths that you can find in the in you know in the burn forest, the problem is that deforestation was it's a, it's a massive problem in the country. We did a transect, a long transect out, across the whole island from the very north to the very south, and we tried to document the relationship between bats and and human society. One of the first things that we found was bats being served in the restaurants. Okay, as you can see here, rosettes. This was in the capital, the first, the very first day we landed after the airport. That was the, the restaurant. As you can see, pretty fancy restaurant, probably for tourists because the prices were so expensive. And this is the kind of fancy meal that they were, you know, uh, offering in the restaurant. Just a very a parenthesis here. What we want to do with Juan is to depth, is to document the relation between bats and human society but using a bare new vision with no prejudices. So we wanted to show the relation as it is with no guilty people, no nothing, like no judgment, just very objective um, elements, okay? So we traveled to the North and we discovered bats being sold, uh, being sold in the markets very commonly as we did with rabbits in Europe, like exactly the same thing. They were just, uh, you know, offering us a meal. We met some people actually in the market. We met a woman that offered to join her in her house to have a meal during the weekend. And we went, they served some bats to the family, to you know, the grand grandparents, to the child, to everyone. That's something that they really enjoyed and was like a meal for, you know, for the weekend as we did for many things. But we also discovered some, you know, road restaurants where trucks, and big trailers stop for regular meals. The prices that you can see, they are not extremely expensive here, differently to the restaurant in the capital. And the, the bats were served very commonly to many, many people here. 
Actually, all of these are um, pans full with meats and uh, you know uh, full with some some meals to, to be served during the day. Something very intense. But we also met Philippe. Philippe was a, a hunter for many many years. He was hunting, but since he was eighteen, and he was so keen and so nice to basically show us, you know, his family how the you know the practice of hunting bats how he hunted them and i've been working with bats for many years now and i can tell you that philippe was handling bats with excellence i mean you could see that how good was he handling the bats how good he knew the movements avoid the bites um, he was very in this sense very professional but the thing is that philip was hunting bats occasionally just to feed his family and, you know, maybe sometimes to change them for some rice or some other, some other products. And that's one of the bats that he hunted. That's one of the bats into the wild, to, just for you to see the faces. That's Terophor rufus, one of the endemic species. And then we move to the very south. We visit the dry forest. You can see here some cactaceae, some baobabs, some euphorbias, some plants. And then we met Gaga. Gaga was another character of the story. Uh, he was part of one of these hunters gatherers communities. He, they did not grow plants, they did not have agriculture. They basically fed the whole community with the products that nature brought to them, like in this case, bats. So he was hunting bats on a big cave, the cave that I just uh, showed to you. And what you can see here in the picture is all these bushes in the sides, they were not natural growing here. So basically Gaga put the trees here to make a funnel so the bats would just fly on top of his head and then he could kick them with the branches. Uh, they also use some fire to make them fly inside the caves and then kick them with a the stick again. And that was like, again, self-subsistence because they hunted the bats again occasionally in the for the community the thing is again we were uh, invited by them to join them uh, and this is practically the whole community very very small in the very deep of the dry forest we had to walk like three four hours just to just reach some part where we can where we continued walking for a few more hours just to reach the the community that was kind of a an you know an intense trip and then Again, we moved to the center of the island again when we were leaving. We discovered these tiny Mormopterus jugularis living in huge colonies in the houses. And then we met uh, the counselor of a big village, Kelly Lalina. And this guy just mentioned to us that he was using the guano already twice per year for the two rice seasons to fertilize the, you know, the fields. That was the first mentioned the first finding that we had that someone was actually using the guano to fertilize the fields and that was very nice to conclude our story that basically the use of guano the you know the knowledge of ecosystem services could be used to improve bat conservation for those who probably know this guano mat brand this is international you can find guano mat probably in all your countries but uh, I have to say that it was extremely difficult to us to understand where Guanomad was collecting guano. They did not want to tell us where they went, the caves they were using, the methods they were using. That was kind of a black way to go. And we did not manage to actually, con so we contacted them all, even the directors of the companies, but it was hard to find the information that we needed. And um, this is apparently one of the caves that they use that we managed to find using, you know, local contacts and friends. And this is one of the main characters of the of the story. This is uh, uh, Kaidefan, uh, one of the protectors. And basically, just to conclude my talk, because I think I'm running out of time now, um, this picture, I want to say, is not a fake picture. For those who likes you know, taking pictures, you know that most of the images that are used worldwide, they are just prepared, they are kind of fake images. But this one I have to say was real. I mean, I was talking to the director of school and I just put that book outside 
randomly. And these guys were just having so much fun and they were reading the book so interestingly. I think that this is the way we have to go. We have to use the scientific knowledge of ecosystem services to talk to farmers and also to educate new generations. Um, well, as a take home message, I think that we have to highlight that bats provide essential roles of pest controllers. That's all around the world. We've seen so many examples from America, Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, so everywhere. I think that ecosystem services can be easily used to connect people. I agree with the criticizers that basically say that ecosystem is not an excellent way to protect the nature because as soon as there is a cheaper pesticide, then the ecosystem service is just screwed. But I think that is the only tool that we have to do some changes in a relatively rapid time and in short time. And then this third take home message is mostly related with the photographic article. The country specific context and the people background need to be carefully assessed. So this trip that we did in Madagascar, uh, I saw so many different realities, so many, many different restaurants like from the mm, very fancy restaurant to the very, you know, to the hunter gatherers uh, societies and communities. And we need to be very careful, especially us from European countries to go to other countries and make judgments. I think we should not, of course, we should not do that. It's not that I think, it's, of course, we should not do that. But we have to be very careful evaluating how we present ecosystem services in the reality of each country. And just to finalize my talk, uh, I've just put here many institutions that have supported my work and the work of all the team I'm, I'm working with. Uh, I will not go one by one. I just want to thank all the people that is by my side, even in my country, but also abroad, that they are helping me and we're working together. This talk is as theirs as mine. And these are just a snapshot of the people um, that I'm just mentioning. So thank you very much all. I think that we will probably have time for short questions and I will be very glad to answer everything. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adria, for uh, an excellent, fascinating talk, uh, for giving us that um, overview, uh, reminder of many of the ecosystem services that BATS um, provide to us. Um, and also for telling us about your story and how you're using that information to, to change perceptions about bats and to help their, their conservation. Um, I thought that was a, a really um, um, exciting part of your presentation. Uh, we do have some time uh, for questions. Uh, obviously, if, if people uh, need to leave, uh, that's uh, understandably, but if you want to stay uh, for a few minutes for questions, then uh, we can do that. Um, there is already a couple of questions um, in the chat um, and also lots of uh, nice comments about your talk. Um, the first question uh, from Alison, uh, she says, perfect talk, uh, Adria. So what do you do to prevent bats, birds and other taxa from uh, being trapped in the net, in the net when you're conducting the exclusion experiments? Yeah, so hi, Alison. Thanks for your question. That's an excellent question. I was extremely afraid of this when we started working with exclosures. And we carefully had to choose this, the right side of the mesh because if it was too small, then we had serious problems with the insects to free freely, so let them freely fly in and out of the top of the exclosure. And if it was too big, we had the problem for the animals to fly in and out. So the basically the size that we needed to use, it's about five, six centimeters of mesh. And we, we could not change it too much because of these reasons. And then we check exactly what you are asking me. If other birds and other taxa just got trapped in the exclosures, in the, you know, in the exclosures. And during the first weeks, we just monitored exclosure so intensively uh, just to avoid any problems. And I have to say that no birds, no birds were um, trapped. Uh, basically, the small passerines, they use our net to rest. 
So they basically just hang on the, you know, on the holes and they went in and out, no problem. And the big ones, the maximum thing that it could happen, like kind of a duck or something, is that they kick the, the net and they fly away. But this happened very rarely. I think because of the color, the big birds just they could see it very easily. The you know the 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 strings of the net was not so thin that I think that for birds it was e kind of easy to see. Uh, the same happened to Carol. Carol is the student that is replicating this in Mexico. I was a little bit afraid because maybe other species could get trapped like that. I was not aware. And for the four or five months that the exclosures have been up, no problems were detected. So in that sense, I'm, I'm happy to say that they were kind of um, yeah, safe for the, spe for the other species, flying species. Other problems is the cows, if you have cows inside the, the rice paddies. But fortunately, no cows were around. Thanks for that, Adria. Um, there's another question from Peter um, asking what you think is the practical potential of Cairo surveillance for early forecasting for agricultural pests from bad diet? Um, your data from Mediterranean rice paddy seems to support it, but it's expensive to do um, the research for known areas. Yeah, that's another excellent question. So that's something that we discussed a lot. Um, because of course, our early detection was circumstantial. I mean, we were not looking for it. We were doing another project and suddenly these species pop up in our results. And we were discussing if this actually would be, you know, something to, to, to encourage to people to do this passive hero surveillance. And I think that every, Every day, the costs are being reduced and reduced for the analysis. So nowadays, you can analyze you know, hundreds of samples for a relatively few amount of money. And it's something that maybe now it might be some expensive, so a bit expensive for some countries, but maybe in the future, that's something that could be you know, easily applied in, in real life. And nevertheless, it's something to keep in mind because many people are doing, you know, uh, genetic analysis from diet, from feces. And sometimes we're not looking into pests. So sometimes we just get all the list of species that we do not pay attention to this. And this is something that we could easily apply to, to the projects that are already being carried out in the field. There's another question, a sort of follow up from uh, one you already answered about the exclosures. Uh, how do you make sure to exclude only bats? Is there a solution that does not involve uh, opening and closing the exclosures every day? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did the two experimental designs. Uh, in Mexico, because the pest that we had was just kind of crepuscular and it was you know, so, uh, so both birds and bats were affecting these pest species. Cattle were opening and closing the exclosure every day. That was hard because that was that means that for five uh, five months, four or five months, you need someone to go there and open and close the exclosure every night. In the case uh, of the experiment in Spain, Chilo supersalis is mainly uh, consumed by bats. And the only animal species that consume the pest is like the, in, in English is called, um, how is it called? This kind of nocturnal bird. I don't know the name in English now. Uh, anyway, it's a nocturnal bird and it's very rare in the area, very, very rare. So we assume that there would be a tiny error or bias here because this bird was could be also consuming the, the, mod, the mods, but it was not something really relevant that basically, you know, we decided to keep them close and assume that the pest was only affected, this pest was only affected by, by bats. Hey, thanks for that. There's some Night, other oh, sorry, the, the name is Niger. Uh, yeah. You will just say, yeah, Niger. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, another question asking about uh, your travels uh, and your interaction with people um, and whether or not you ran into contact with people who were afraid of that because of, uh, of COVID and um, yeah, mm -hmm. how that fitted into your, um, yeah, your study looking at people's perceptions. Mm, yeah, actually, that is not something that I sporadically find people afraid of bad spreading COVID. That's my daily life. <laughs> so we have this project called SOS Bats in Spain, and we got calls from people asking things like that, if bats spread COVID, if bats spread rabies. Actually, I just deleted one of the slides from the beginning of my presentation, just to keep my talk on time which I hardly manage. But uh, basically, one of the things that make me uh, work on ecosystem services is that I believe one of the most difficult, uh, one of the most important difficulties we are facing is that changing perceptions. So as scientists, we are providing so much information about forest fragmentation, about habitat loss, about so many things. But then in real life on the ground, we have a lot of problems to, you know, to protect caves, to protect old forests, to protect sustainable agriculture, I, to, to encourage sustainable agriculture. So the real conservation, we have a lot of information to be applied in real conservation. And this is not being applied for many reasons. But one of the reasons is that we do not engage with the rights public. And this is part of your question. I mean, it's not that people are afraid of bad spreading COVID, but you, you can see the money invested in you know, some projects looking for COVID and then the money spent it on conservation of specific areas that really need conservation straight away right now. And we have a problem. So that's the thing. That's one of the reasons that I, I keep working on these ecosystem services because the engagement of the public, politics, journalists is not right. And we need to work on this. Yeah, and that's like the example you showed about you setting up the bat boxes and then the farmers coming back to you because they noticed that that was helping them um, in their suppressing the, the population of pests. Um, mm. that, and changing that perception of bats, that's, I think, a really uh, wonderful story to illustrate the importance of, of getting the knowledge across and, and working with the people who, um, mm. yeah, who are best placed to implement uh, the changes to, that we need uh, to help the bat populations. Mm. Um, I had another question um, about um, the bat box related to the bat boxes and whether or not you assess the availability of natural roosts around the areas or is that practically zero because of the type of landscapes where you're working? Yeah, so in the Ebro Delta specifically, there is no need to assess uh, roots, uh, roost uh, availability because there's none. I mean, in so many kilometers, you cannot see a tree. And when you find a house, there is many bats there. I mean, if you make a hole on the on a wall, you will find a bat in a few weeks. I mean, they they really need they really 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 need um, roost. So and that's not a, that's not a lie. I mean, I've seen walls like artificial walls with the holes, new holes, and then you find bats in these holes. I've seen Ivana here in the public. She was collaborating in this project, and she can just confirm that that it's just bats in every single two centimeters of space. And because there's so few spaces and there's lots of water, lots of insects, lots of food availability. In other areas, we've also tried the use of bad boxes and it's not as easy in the Ebro Delta. So if you find like a rice paddy that is surrounded by kind of forest or urbanizations or something like this, then the bad boxes are, are not that successful. But as I assume, there are many extensive areas in the world of agricultural lands that they are not planning to change them in a few years. I mean, that would be excellent, right? Like having an extensive agricultural area of kilometers of crops and having an initiative to make them as a mosaic of forest and patches, but that's not going to happen. 
And because it's not going to happen, using bad boxes in these places makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. It was also really interesting to see in your other example in, in Madagascar, I think, where you were using acoustic recorders to, to see where the bats were foraging. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have higher activity on the rice paddies compared to forest areas as well? That was really, um, yeah, that just caught my attention because it sounded a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. We got that because uh, I guess like the big colonies of molossid that we have that, that we had in the in the buildings, they were probably probably using the buildings because the forest was so you know so crap in terms of size and quality. I mean it was small patches. Like truly, when you go to Madagascar, the the forests are lovely, but they are so small. I mean you arrive and you see the the rice paddies. And then you see the edge of the natural park and then the forest start right there. There's no buffer area. And you can even sometimes see the other extreme of the park. So the forests are really, really small. And most of the species that were, you know, hunting in the rice paddies were the ones roosting in the houses. Yeah. So I think the bat community in the forest in Madagascar, they are struggling. They are really struggling. So we are talking here about two different groups of species. One of so the forest dwelling species in Madagascar, they might probably be struggling to survive. And then we have the house dwelling bats. They are kind of okay because they have the houses and they have the rice paddies. So they they are handling the deforestation pretty well, I would say. Yeah, so that was going to be my, my final question uh, in terms of whether or not it's a few species that are likely to be providing the bulk of that ecosystem service. Yeah, um, I think that this is this could be like a parallelism with, Sp with the Spanish example. So the most common species, the most versatile and opportunistic species are probably the ones providing these ecosystem services because they are the ones... Uh, that have large numbers of populations, that have largest colonies, and the ones that they are usually foraging in open spaces like agricultural lands. It's like two, two different stories. We, as, as I see it, we can use the ecosystem services to increase the quality of the crops, use less pesticides, increase the, you know, the harvest, and you know, increase the, the quality of the food and increase food security. And then using this story, we can approach people to the natural biology of bats and tell them like, hey, there are other bat species in the forest and you are also helping them. I mean, I think it's like the connection. That's why I really like to speak about connecting bats and people because we need a tool to connect the bats with the people. And then we can start speaking about the forest dwelling bats. We cannot start to, to speak about forest dwelling bats if we don't connect them first. At least it's my experience in, in Spain. In Spain, it works. <laughs> but it's really nice to see that you have examples in different places around the world. Um, so you are gathering information uh, that seems to go towards the same, um, the same answer that you just mentioned. Um, and I think that's probably a, a, a good, really good place to finish the, the presentation for today and on a very positive note. Um, and just um, just to thank you again, Adria, for uh, an excellent presentation and um, for your time uh, engaging with the questions as well. There's a few other comments and a couple of questions that I didn't uh, manage to get through in the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone seemed to be uh, really impressed with your with your talk. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you thank everyone you for, for coming today. Um, and please uh, continue to join uh, our webinars uh, in, in the future if you, if you can. Um, Thanks again, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your days.